All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we are fortunate to have with us today our good friend Ari Ezra Waldman, um, who was recently visiting at CITP before the world changed. Um, Ari is professor of law and computer science uh, at, um, at uh, Northeastern. He's also the faculty director of their Center for Law, Information, and Creativity, or CLIC. Um, he's written very widely on privacy, choice architecture, algorithmic fairness, online harassment, misinformation, many, many areas where technology and society intersect, and he has uh, terrific insights on all of them. Um, he's one of my go-to authors when I want to start exploring an area, but if Ari's written about it, that's, that's going to be towards the top of my list of what to look at first. Um, he's uh, also written a couple of books. Uh, in 2018, he wrote a book examining privacy issues through the lens of trust. Um, and uh, this year, he's uh, authored a book, and what we're going to hear about today, uh, on um, privacy and power uh, in, uh, in, in the tech sector and uses of technology, um, which I particularly appreciate. There's, I think, not nearly enough focus in academia on facts on the ground um, as distinct from law and policy in the abstract. Um, there's so much to say about Ari's impressive accomplishments. Let me just highlight a few. Um, he's a member of the American Law Institute. Uh, he's worked with the Anti-Defamation League. Of late, he has been working with the uh, state of New York on examining uh, how courts might work after COVID. Um, near and dear to my heart, he's a JD PhD. He has a PhD in sociology. Um, um, but as I mentioned previously, perhaps most important, he spent some time at CITP. All right, let me wrap up there. Um, Ari, great to see you again, um, and I very much look forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Jonathan, and I appreciate that um, overly uh, a generous introduction. I feel the same about you, and I feel uh, so grateful to be back here, uh, virtually at least, talking with, with people at CITP, because my time, although interrupted by COVID, it's where CITP is where I wrote this book, uh, where I drafted and threw out, then revised, then redrafted, then threw out, then revised uh, much of this book. Uh, so being at CATP was a really great opportunity to uh, talk with people like Jonathan and Arvind and Matt and everyone as I was thinking through this, including Mahir, who um, uh, was really helpful in giving kind of on the ground perspectives. So I'm gonna talk for a little bit, little bit, maybe 20 minutes, a little bit more about the book. I wanna give ample time for questions, uh, maybe 20, 30 minutes, give ample time for questions and discussion. Uh, as Jonathan said, this book is about um, privacy on the ground. It's based on uh, nearly four years, about three and a half years of field work. I'll talk a little bit more about methods as we get going. So I'm gonna share my screen. You can see me there in the corner, right? Everything that looked good. Uh, all right, so um, this, my book is called Industry Unbound. Uh, it is about um, what I learned uh, over three and a half years being inside and in, inside tech companies and interviewing current and former uh, employees. So um, let's start, let's frame the conversation this way. So when uh, Frances Haugen goes before uh, Congress or the UK Parliament, she is blowing the whistle on bad things that she found uh, while working at a company like Facebook. Um, so that's normally the situation for a whistleblower. I'm about to tell you a story about people who are blowing the whistle without knowing that they're blowing the whistle. And in fact, they're not even aware that what they're talking about is actually bad or is actually putting their employer or their own work in a bad light. Now that's a really interesting, um, really strange, almost cognitively dissonant uh, space to be in where what I found is that among some privacy professionals and engineers and others inside big tech companies and medium-sized tech companies, there's this false consciousness about how they do their work and about what they're doing with respect to privacy. So normally, uh, when we interact, not just um, those of us who are high information uh, interactors with tech here at CITP, but when most people interact with technology, they see, uh, interact with technology companies, they see things like companies saying that their pri our privacy is important to them, 
uh, that control over our privacy choices is how they approach their privacy work, that um, all they're trying to do is their privacy departments are all about giving us more control, giving us more decisions, giving us more opportunities. We can be excused if we roll our eyes in uh, with some incredulity about these because it seems like no matter how many times these companies say they care about their privacy, they don't really do anything to actually protect our privacy. And in fact, uh, every day, every week, there's another um, piece of technology or another advancement or change in how companies are using technology that seems to erode our privacy. Whether we're talking about glasses that have cameras or focus on the metaverse or facial recognition, uses of artificial intelligence to make social decisions and so forth. So for the next few minutes, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first start out with my argument, um, talk a little bit about methods, give some examples of what I found inside the information industry, and then talk briefly about some implications. So let's start with the argument. Um, tech companies leverage the coercive capacities of their organizational structures to essentially co-opt both the law and the people who are employed and responsible for implementing the law of privacy through manipulating and co-opting privacy discourse, co-opting privacy compliance or compliance with the law and co-opting privacy design. What they do is, and they create this world um, through their organizational structures where the only type of work that uh, privacy professionals and employees can do is anti-privacy work. It's essentially habituating people into thinking that the work that they're doing, which may sound privacy protective or autonomy enhancing, actually is in effect um, pursuing or advancing the data extractive goals of the company. And they do this so well that most of the people on the ground don't even know it. They don't even know that their, um, that their actions, their behaviors, their performances of privacy are not in, in, in support or in fostering of privacy, they're actually in support of their employers or informational capitalistic ends. Um, we facilitate our own subjugation through our clicks, through our uh, click to agrees, our toggle buttons. Privacy professionals who consider themselves uh, privacy advocates, even people who say, and who said to me and to say publicly that companies only hire them if they care about privacy. Sometimes these are the people who are most complicit because of this false consciousness that they develop, because of how co-opted they become inside companies. Um, and this makes the law that we pass not just insufficient on their face, uh, on its face, but also as applied. Uh, the goal of this project is really nothing short than reshaping um, how we think about privacy law, how we might write it, how we might go about thinking about privacy in general, but also how we think about the privacy profession. When I give this talk before, or a version of this talk before groups like the IAPP or the, the International Association of Privacy Professionals or the Future of Privacy Forum or conferences where privacy professionals that I specifically say, like, I am coming for your job in a way. I'm coming for the way you do your jobs right now because the way they're doing it is not helpful. So uh, briefly about methods. This is, a, um, this is an ethnographic project that is based on uh, embed the embedded observations of three technology companies uh, that, I, uh, that I observed over a period of several, um, over a period of about a year, uh, as well as, uh, and in, while embedded inside these companies, I sat in on design meetings, I sat in on privacy meetings, um, interviewed people, spoke with people, followed them to their desk, just watched what they were doing, uh, full on you know, embedding in, in, in a company, as well as interviews with current and former employees of big tech companies. I was not allowed, I did not gain access to companies like Facebook, Google, and so forth. They had extraordinarily unethical demands for participating, for their participation in this project. There are some researchers who, uh, who follow those demands, like uh, giving Facebook, uh, Facebook employees and Facebook management and communications departments final say on the quotes that they put in their publications. So because I wasn't willing to do that and compromise my ethics, um, we had to go about, I had to go about it in a different way. It's one of the reasons why the research took about three and a half years. Now, of course, what that means is 
The findings here are not about every single technology company or every single privacy professional. They're really about the, the uh, tools or the behaviors of these companies and to see if there are any commonalities, any trends or any effects that these tools or these uh, hierarchies or organizational structures have on privacy. It's really about highlighting a narrative that exists in contrary to what the conventional wisdom has been before um, I started writing about this. So as I said, there are three, three large areas, three broad areas where, the co where companies use their organizational structures in order to habituate their employees or co-opt their employees into doing privacy work in a way that actually uh, supports or advances their data extractive ends. And the first way is discourse. And that's about how companies get people, not just us, but their employees, to think about what privacy means. Uh, and if when they say, when, when you go up to someone and say, you know, the, I, I'm a privacy professional, you know, what do they mean when they say privacy or what, what, what do they mean by the work that they're doing for privacy? And there are lots of different ways that companies uh, take people who are otherwise really interested and concerned about privacy and end up co-opting their work into data extractive ends. And I talk about quite a few of them in a long chapter in the book. Um, Companies will set the privacy agenda for their privacy teams. Management will set the agenda. So for example, in one of the privacy departments that I observed in one of these technology companies where they were designing a photo sharing, uh, designing a photo sharing app while I was there, they had a medium sized privacy department. They had about five professionals and lawyers doing work uh, strictly on privacy. But when you look at their workflow, Almost all of their work as designated by their boss, the chief privacy officer, as well as the uh, CEO of the company, almost all of their workflow was about notice. It was about fixing privacy policies. It was about making privacy policies longer. They published a report about transparency. All of the work that they had been doing, in fact, over the last two years before I got there and while I was there, had been all about notice, right? So it should come as no surprise that when you talk to these people, when you talk to the people who do this work, that their vision of privacy is all about notice and transparency. And uh, I'm sure many of us in this room are very keenly aware about how inadequate that is. When all you're given are a gazillion choices about what to do, every, every toggle button on every app and every website that you go to, that's not actually empowering, that is subordinating. Um, and a lot of scholars have written about the subordinating powers of, of choice. Um, another really interesting tool that companies use in order to co-opt their workers into advancing uh, data extractive goals, even if they consider themselves privacy advocates, is through the zealous advocacy canon for lawyers. So I saw this quite a bit among junior lawyers in uh, the uh, general counsel's office at companies, where um, I would, uh, for example, and here's one specific story, it was that one of these companies that I was visiting um, actually wrote a brief in a case in federal court, which specifically said that information shared on their platform uh, is uh, not subject to any privacy protections whatsoever. Once you share it, it's gone, it's out there, uh, you have no control over it, right? Again, the vision of privacy based on privacy is control. So, and yet in, the, in, our, in my interviews with them, with the general counsel and other, uh, other of their colleagues, they specifically said the opposite. They said that people do have privacy interests and a privacy, uh, privacy rights and information that might be disclosed on their platform. So when I showed them the brief and I said, well, how can you justify that position with the argument that you made in this brief? They said, well, I have to do everything that my client requires me in order to achieve the best goal for my employer. Essentially saying that it's okay for me to lie whether it's to me or to the court or to people and to the court or the court, as long as and not care about privacy, because all I have to do is achieve the best goal, best possible goal for my client. Essentially, these are not anti-privacy. This is not some, you know, Mr. Burns style evil villain at the top of a company with tented fingers and trying to figure out every possible way to, in, to erode privacy. What they're doing is they're making these choices, they're making these decisions that end up 
um, focusing work in an anti-privacy direction, whether that's finding friendly academics and getting approval for their quotes and painting them in a positive light or hiding behind the zealous advocacy canon or making sure that all their privacy professionals do is focus on privacy in terms of transparency and choice. With privacy being understood in such a permissive or unhelpful way, um, the, uh, the next thing that companies do is after co-opting their employees in terms of how they think about privacy, they co-opt the law. They co-opt the law through their responsibility for compliance. Right? So there are a lot of ways that companies do this. Uh, and again, where individuals, where workers become whistleblowers without even knowing it. So there is no doubt that over the last several years, the work that privacy teams inside companies have done has risen exponentially, whether that's because more people care about privacy or it's because of the GDPR. It's mostly because all of the, the GDPR and the CCPA have compliance requirements. So often I would get these comments similar to this. We are super busy. Of course, look at this work product that we're, that we're putting out every week, stacks of papers. And here, let me show you all these files. I had a meeting where essentially the privacy team all just sent me, here are all the things that we've created over this last week, over this last month, to show you how much, how much impact we're having. But then I asked them, well, how has, how has this really good work impacted the products that you create? And then I would ask them and I would show them, well, here's a product that you just came out, that your company came, just came out with. And in one example, it was an app that required a login with Facebook or Google, didn't have an option for logging in as a guest. And uh, behind the user interface, the code was data extractive. The code uh, took, um, took all sorts of user data from uh, just merely using the app. And I said, well, how have you had an impact on this if this is no different than what we've been seeing before? The company was also using AI to identify uh, to, for facial recognition purposes. And they said, well, of course we're changing things. Look at all this work that they're doing. Like they couldn't even realize that the reports that they've been completing the documents that they've been sharing and the boxes that they've been checking are really just procedure for procedure's sake and not having any impact on, um, on the end product. Uh, also, companies do a really good job of making privacy offices precarious, whether they split budgets between different departments. So one of the companies I observed, the privacy budget was split between IT general counsel's budget and compliance. So whenever the privacy, the chief privacy officer, who may have been, who was a board level position or, or who sat in on board meetings or reported directly to the CEO, if ever they wanted to do anything, they had to get uh, the IT guy or the general counsel or compliance vice president on board. No budget controlled by, uh, on their own. Another easy way to make privacy professionals job precarious is to react negatively when someone may try to slow down a product or, or resist doing some data extractive, um, uh, re resi resist a data extractive procedure or element of a new product. One of the things that the privacy professionals would tell me is that I can't be the one saying no all the time, that no one is gonna listen to me or I'm gonna get fired or my boss specifically said that I should not stand in the way of innovation. And no one wants to stand in a way of innovation at these companies. And by making their jobs and their funding even more precarious, it's a lot harder for someone to go out on a limb and say, no, we shouldn't do this. Rarely did anyone have an, op op an opportunity to stop a product or to change a product design because they weren't given the opportunity. They, or they purposely self-modified their own advice in order to maintain access to the chief executive or in order to be listened to, right? But how is that gonna help if you never make a, you never make a difference in the design of products? And there are lots of other examples. Um, uh, an, another really good example of co-opting the law here is um, one, of the, one of the companies where I was embedded, um, we had these things in the law called privacy impact assessments, which are essentially uh, tools for companies while they're building new products to evaluate the privacy effects, 
or the effects on privacy that would have for this new product. Um, and one of the things that I saw was that this privacy impact assessment that the privacy team had developed had been boiled down to a simple chart with several, with about 10 questions on, on the left column, and then two columns to the right, yes and no. And there was this piece of paper that was laminated sitting on the engineer's desks as they were doing their work. And on the laminated uh, on the on the laminated paper, some they had written in in ink, just check here and in the no column, essentially saying just check the box, just check the box that whatever you're doing has no privacy impact or no negative privacy impact on consumers. And then when I asked the chief privacy officer and the general counsel about this, they said, well, we have to make it very simple for them because engineers don't understand anything about privacy. And one of the things that was really, really clear from re this research is that it's become so common, it's become so uh, popular to blame engineers for the erosion of privacy in you know, technology products, because obviously they're doing the design. But when you have a team, but engineers don't do things on their own. They exist within organizational structures. They follow rules. They follow requirements that are set for them. And when you have privacy, uh, privacy professionals and general counsels that are saying that engineers are stupid and essentially saying, just check this box. Well, that's not the engineer's fault. That's not the engineer's fault that they're not educating the design team on how to address these issues, which leads us to the final area, the final broad area where the company uses its internal structures to prevent privacy from gaining a foothold in, uh, in their companies and in their project products, and that's in the design stage. And there are so many different um, strategies that companies that I saw use in order to keep privacy out of design. Uh, one way to keep and that affects engineers again, not always engineers' fault, right? Is you have, have may have one big product, and uh, lots of different engineering teams are working on this product. That's generally how it works, even in small companies uh, with just a handful of engineers. You have a lot of different issues, and you're separated into different engineering teams. One of the things that these companies did in order to limit any one engineer engineers opportunity or capacity to influence the broader design, including privacy, is to keep each team ignorant of what other teams are doing. They would say, I, I even saw a situation where an engineer went to the product manager and said, well, I have some concerns about this, um, but this is outside the question or the problem that you asked me to address. What should we, um, I'd like to go, I'd like to go fix this. And I would say, no, someone else is dealing with that. Don't bother yourself with what other teams are supposed to do. You focus on this. In a way, what I found is that for a lot of engineers that um, that's what they want, right? They just wanna be able to focus on the problem that's in front of them. But how is someone supposed to, how is a product going to um, integrate privacy into design when everyone is in the position of thinking that someone else is dealing with it when in fact, someone else may not actually be dealing with it. Another way that privacy, the companies make it so that privacy can't gain a foothold in design is they insist that whatever privacy is has to be limited to what is codable. So when a, when a privacy advocate, one of the meetings that I sent, that I sat in on was a meeting between a company design team and its uh, privacy professionals and civil society. And the civil society organization wanted to encourage the company, which had a social networking aspect to their um, to their platform to integrate privacy enhancing tools and to protect against harassment and so forth. And then the, the response was, okay, how do I code for that? Like, how do I know what people are upset about? There were all these excuses that engineer, the engineering vice president and privacy professionals inside the company offer saying, well, we can't do that. The only thing that we can do is make it codable. Uh, and of course, there are lots of other, um, there are lots of other uh, examples of this. And of course, one of the biggest ones is just privileging engagement. This is something that Frances Haugen talked about at, uh, in her testimony before Congress, is that when your directive from the top, from your boss, is to enhance engagement, and that's the only thing, right? everything else falls by the wayside. I was able to observe a, um, an engineer who was uh, triggering, um, fiddling around with design, what um, some of us might call dark patterns in order to achieve better engagement in some in particular direction on their on
I don't know how I just was muted. Um, on the course of uh, just a few minutes, he had um, A-B tested uh, different designs of colors of buttons and so forth that basically would encourage or manipulate people into putting more things into their uh, cart. So, and everyone was just, well, this is how it's done, right? This is, this is what we do. There's nothing wrong with any of this. This is just what privacy is. This just was our work. Um, this is just what our work is. Uh, and the end result here is that when people are limited in the, it, when people are limited by the governing structure, the organizational structure of a company into what they can do with respect to privacy, they become used to doing what they're doing. So one final example I'll give you is that at every company that I uh, observed, and of course, that doesn't mean that this is true of every company out there, the relationship between the lawyers and uh, the privacy lawyers and uh, the engineers designing products on the ground was, was divided. Um, they were kept apart from one another. A lawyer who may have who may have, who may represent or may be there uh, or, or be there focusing on this product or this team was not allowed under the organizational structure to affirmatively go and sit in on design meetings. That was the result of kind of turf battles. The only way a privacy question would get to the lawyer was if it went up the chain from the engineer themselves. And of course, that meant that an engineer would have to notice it and then go to their manager, who would take it to their manager, who would take it to, and all of those are probably former coders, who would take it to the product manager, who would then take it to the lawyer if it made it that way, right? That means that 99% of privacy issues, if they were ever spotted, were addressed ad hoc by engineers who may not have the training to do so. So another example of a structure that made it, again, not overtly or purposefully anti-privacy, but the result of it is the inability of privacy to gain a foothold in design. The end result is that everyone kind of got used to this. Well, this is what we do. This is what privacy law is. We don't not collect information about these people. We just fill out these forms when we do collect it. That's what the GDPR requires. So people became used to the work that they were doing. It just so happens that the work that the company gave them was all in support of data extracted ends. And once you become habituated in that way, it becomes the norm, it becomes common, it becomes commonsensical. So when people, when I would ask questions, well, why don't we do it this way? I got more quizzical looks than anything else. I was like, well, why would we do that? That's not what privacy is. It's because they have been habituated into this false consciousness. And then finally, so what do we do about it? You know, even books are works in progress. So. I'm, we're still working, on, I'm still working on that. Um, my vision for a more liberatory privacy law may be far, maybe radical, um, but I think what we have to do is we, we can't stop short of regulating the business model or even we need to think about nationalizing information industries uh, in order to serve more liberatory or emancipatory ends because these companies are never gonna do so on their own. And the way we write laws, even a law that's more robust or even a law about criminal penalties or even a law that has you know, Dodd-Frank-like um, uh, audit committees, you know, all of these structures are gonna be co-opted by these companies and they've gotten really, really good at it. And as a result of getting really, really good at co-opting the systems that we create, it's hard for me to imagine what a emancipatory or liberatory privacy law might look like other than you know, keeping on, other than you know, radical structural change. But admittedly, that's something that, uh, that I'm still working on. At a minimum, what it does require is it requires a wholesale reorienting of how we conceive of law. Law shouldn't be about fostering innovation in the information industry. It should be a counterweight to corporate power. Uh, whether that's strong labor protections for researchers inside tech companies or robust transparency requirements so independent academics can hold companies accountable with access to their information, or if it's um, you know, strong environmental protections, anti-competition uh, regulations that limit the reach and power of these companies, all of these together, right? I'm not even sure that all of these together would work.
right? Which is why we need to think something, we need to think outside this box. We need to think of something um, far more radical in order to essentially avoid a problem that under you know, neoliberal, um, uh, neoliberal governmentality is unavoidable, like right? the co-optation of workers for the company's ends. So happy to talk more about methods or about anything else that I found in the book. Obviously, this is a necessarily abbreviated version of the evidence and stories. I have a ton more stories that are in the book and that some didn't make it in the book. And I'm eager, and as I said, all of these are still works in progress. So I'm eager for your questions about either what we talked about or what comes next. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ari. A terrific presentation on uh, subversion and co-opting of discourse and regulation in this area. Um, I would say it is broadly very consistent regrettably consistent with my experience in the area. Um, all right, we have, we have run out of time. I recognize there are folks who still have burning questions, um, but I, I think um, the thing to do if you'd like to follow up is follow up with Ari, who's a very friendly fellow. Um, and let's wrap up there. Thank you, Ari, for, for joining us in such a lively conversation. Um, lots to think about. Yeah, right. thank you so much, Jonathan. And yes, please don't hesitate to email always happy to chat. And it's so great to see all of you. Thank you so much.